Thank you. After that, Chris will speak to us. The word of God from John, First John, chapter three, verse sixteen to the end. That is page one two two seven in the New Testament. First John chapter three, verse sixteen to the end. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God <coughs> be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. Whenever our hearts condemn, in presence, whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, in our hearts do, do not condemn us. We have confi confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is the command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commands us. Those who obey his commands live in him and he in, in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. second reading is John 10 verse 11 to 18 page 1076 on church Bibles it's John 10 verse 11 to 18 1076 in church Bibles I am the good shepherd the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep the hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep, so when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is high at hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. I have over sh other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again, so no one takes it from me. But I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my Father. This is the word of the Lord. A very good morning to you. It's great to be with you, and uh, I really appreciate your invite. Um, we feel at home. Um, and interestingly, um, I'll say some more as I go through, but I've I just been overwhelmed by, um, I walked through the door um, and a brother started talking to me and um, pretty much preached my sermon and letting hall um, in sort of in, in five minutes. Uh, the worship, uh, the songs that you shows Andrew brilliant and again I think you'll get the sense and flavor of, of what I believe God wants to to do amongst us um, 
it's quite exciting, isn't it? And, and that's how it should be. We are the people of God. And, and that passage that we just heard about Jesus laying down his sheep and from 1 John, he lives in us. So it's not surprising that he tunes us and gets us on the same page together and kind of says stuff before we've even said. So I feel the ground is, is very much prepared um, for what I want to bring and what I want to share with you. Shall we pray? Would that be good? Oh, yes. <laughs> Father, you are here. I want to pray that, Holy Spirit, you will just increase sense of your presence amongst us. God, your word is powerful. And I pray it will stir our hearts. It will cause hunger to arise in a fresh way. That we'll find ourselves engaging with you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Probably be good if I share a little bit about myself. Um, in readiness for who is this bald-headed geezer who's coming to share again at Letton Hall. Um, so, um, my roots go back to Devon and Cornwall. Um, I became a Christian at the age of 16 when I moved to Maidstone um, to become an ophthalmic nurse specializing in eyes, which I did for 18 months. Became a Christian within the first two weeks of that course. Met a porter and a couple of other student nurses a year ahead. Um, I'd been to church all my life. Um, typical mum sent me to church so she could have some peace and quiet on a Sunday morning. It was <laughs> um, but these guys, um, these guys really knew God. Um, and God was doing things in their lives in a tangible way that I'd not really come across before. It's helping them with their studies. He was helping them minister to people. Um, and then I went, and what really bowled me over was when I went to an Anglican church uh, called St. Faith's in Maidstone, um, and I met a whole community of people who were like that. Um, and I'd never come across anything like it, overwhelmed by the love and the hunger for God. Um, and within a very short space of, of time, said, God, if you're really there, then I want to know you. Because it seemed to me if God really was there, then God wants to be known. Because he created us, made us to know him, for relationship with him. And so I gave my life to Christ, knelt down after one Sunday morning. I said, God, I really want to know you so sorry for the way I've lived my life so far without you and suddenly it was like uh, it was like instead of God being a thought out there somewhere it was like God was standing next to me wow <laughs> and that's been the story of my life really a real hunger for his presence and a knowing that God is real and, and here. And well, if God is here, anything can happen, can't it? Well, um, I got involved in ministry for a number of years and um, eventually ended up leading a church and was traveling around um, in parts of the world ministering at times. Um, and um, one of the places I went and spent some time was with Ben and Heather Rex, who you probably know, who are working out in Nepal, um, or that area of the world, and are now responsible with YWAM, so very mindful of, of them and the ministry over there at this, at this time that we were praying earlier. Um, and then uh, events led up to me sort of, reconsidering what I should be doing and ended up going back to nursing um, about 15 years ago now, something like that. Um, retrained, um, got my whole qualification, um, became a registered nurse. 
My background then in nursing changed from eyes to accident and emergency. So I had about 10 years in accident and emergency. Some of that time then in, in critical care outreach, so responding to deteriorating patients on the wards. And then a couple of years ago, I just felt very stirred by God to move into the area of palliative care. So I'm now um, team leader um, for the palliative care team within the Luton and Dunstable Hospital. There's a tremendous privilege, just started. My first working day as team leader was April Fool's Day. <laughs> no irony there. Um, but really have, um, really have found it a tremendous privilege coming alongside people um, at that point in their life and families and being able to um, care and show kindness and compassion. And you know, it's amazing. One of the things that hits me over and over again as I minister to people in that way, and for me it is ministering to people, um, the thing that hits me is, is so often some of the feedback that comes back is how powerful it is for people being touched by kindness. And I find it overwhelming because the fact that people are overwhelmed by kindness simply by somebody coming alongside them at that time speaks volumes to me of our world and its brokenness and how it is. That it is often for people so unusual to be overwhelmed by simple kindness. That's sad, isn't it? So I have the privilege, oh, I'm also, a, um, at the same time that was happening, just before that happened, I was also appointed as an elder in our local church at Hope. So I've got these two things going on all at, all at the same time, it's great. So, uh, so there you go, that's a little bit about me. Now let me talk about the one that I love to talk about the most. Yes, his name is Jesus. Um, I've entitled this talk, Pursuing Friendship with God and Kids. I didn't realize you were going to be in, but this is really relevant to you as well. And you'll be pleased to know, Martin said I had two hours. <laughs> so it's going to be great. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> So I'm not going to go on and on and on and on and on. We've recently come out of Easter. Um, and the message of Easter is that the veil has been torn in two. He is risen. He has reconciled us back to God. And there is this powerful message that we can encounter God just as I did um, all those years ago. But all those years ago is no good. He's not the God of tomorrow. He's not the God of yesterday. He is the God of today. I am that I am. Now, he is the God of tomorrow because he's there and he holds our tomorrows. And he is the God of yesterday because he was there and he was there and has been through with us every part of our journey. So just in case you think I'm getting into heresy, better put that right. But he is the God of today. And I think sometimes we forget that. And he wants to meet you and be with you every moment, every day of your life. The cross, which is so nicely standing on the wall behind me, is not supposed to be a symbol that we just wear around our neck, but it is a bridge that we are supposed to walk upon into the presence of God. If we don't, then frankly, We've missed the point. So I want to preach to you this morning 
the first message I ever preached as a young man. And young men, prick your ears up. I woke up at three o'clock and have been praying for you since three till five because I felt God particularly stirred my heart for young men. I think God has something to say to you as young men as I preach this morning. But I also think I'm supposed to call into being what is not. And I'm supposed to say to you, God is going to bring many more young men into your midst. <laughs> I take it that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to look at a passage from Exodus um, and 33 um, and I hope you can read that but if not if you turn to Exodus 33 in your Bible and you'll, um, you'll be able to see it there and we're reading from verse 7 and the way I'm going to do this is I'm just going to read the passage and I'll make some comments as we go through the passage and then I'm going to end up saying out of that what we're going to be doing at Letton Hall. Um, I must admit, when Martin introduced me, I sort of <laughs> I did have the thought, I hope the numbers don't go down. <laughs> but here we go. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. Now who was he going to meet in this tent outside the camp? Yeah. The tent of meeting. Get that phrase in your mind, will you? And get it in your heart. It is a tent of meeting. And it is a tent of meeting with none other than the creator of the universe. You are invited to the tent of meeting. You, not the person sat next to you. You, young guys, are invited to the tent of meeting. What do you do when you meet someone? <laughs> You can't meet someone and not know it, can you? Yeah? When you meet the man of your dreams, <laughs> you will know it. <laughs> and everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Everyone who sought the Lord. I wonder where you're at this morning. Everyone who sought the Lord. Are you seeking him this morning? Is your heart hungry for the reality of who he is? Everyone who sought the Lord will go out to the tent of meeting which was outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud, do you remember God used to presence himself as a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire? that the people would know that he was amongst them. We don't have pillars of cloud and pillars of fire anymore. We have someone called the Holy Spirit who is the very fire of God 
who appeared as tongues of fire on the day of Pentecost when the church was born. That passage that was read to us said he lives in us. I don't need to look out for fire and cloud. I need to realize he is right here. But for Moses, the pillar of cloud that was standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship at his tent door. But when they saw this cloud coming, when they realized the presence of God was there, they worshipped. Do you know every time the presence of God is found in the Bible, the response is worship. And do you know that worship in that context is always accompanied by bowing, falling, prostrating. It always involves getting down. And most of the time when the presence of God comes, as in that song that we sang of another time when the presence of God came, they didn't have a choice because the presence of God was so overwhelming they hit the deck. Interesting. Now get this. If you want a powerful verse, then look no further. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. The Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When was the last time, ladies and gentlemen, you were face to face with your God as a man speaks to his friend I'm going to show you in a moment this is not unique to Moses this is God's passion for his people now young men prick your ears up okay are you ready when Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of man, Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Joshua eventually would take over from Moses and lead Israel. But Joshua didn't know that at this point in time. But Joshua was so hungry for the presence of God that when Moses left, Joshua stayed behind. He lingered to be in the presence of God. <coughs> Guys, I wonder what is molding you. I wonder what is getting hold of you. Is it the Lord your God? Or is it other stuff? Because I've come here to tell you, God is after you. Not with a big stick. He's after you because he wants to meet with you like he did with Joshua, eyeball to eyeball. He wants you to know him.
So Moses moves on. And he said to the Lord, See you say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. So he starts off, God, show me your ways. Show me how to live. Show me how you do things. Show me how to be a man. Show me how to be a woman. Show me how to live. God, how do you like things to be done? See, one of my favorite things that I like to say about the church is it's his home. It's not my home. It's not Martin's home. It's his home. And in my home, I have the house the way I want it to be. Actually, that's not quite true, because I have a wife. <laughs> so we have the way, the house, we want it to be. But we set the tone of the house. We have things where we want them. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> this is God's house this is God's house guess who gets to say where the table goes and where the chairs go and what colour the curtains are going to be huh? and whether it's a king size bed or a double size bed yeah it's his house Show me your ways. Consider too that this nation is your people. And he said, so this is God now, my presence will go with you. So what's the consequence of God's presence going with them? And I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us, so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? That so impacted me in 1978 when I read those words as a new Christian and it has stayed with me ever since what is it that differentiates you and I from every other people on the face of the earth it is that God is with us My friends, if that differentiates us from every other people on the face of the earth, that can't be a hidden thing. That can't be an intangible thing. It has to be something that hits you when you come amongst the people of God. You find it in the way that we love each other which was the other passage that was read you find it in the way we care for each other you find it in the way that we pray for each other and stuff happens because God is amongst us and the Lord said to Moses this very thing that you have spoken I will do for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. So we've had, God, show me your ways. God, show me your presence. And now Moses says, God, show me your glory. 
And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for a man shall not see me and live. So previously, God spoke to Moses face to face as a man, but it's using imagery. Yeah? And the Lord said, Behold, there's a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. That kind of rocks your boat, doesn't it? What did Moses see? <laughs> what did he see? Wow. Over and over and over again in the Bible, God shows up. And when he shows up, folk know about it. They know about it. There was that old advert, wasn't there? You know when you've been tangoed. <laughs> well, you know. Do you know, the greatest thing I find when people come into the presence of God, there are, there are two things that always amaze me. One is, they don't want to leave. So when the God is amongst us the most powerfully, I don't know whether you find this, people don't want to leave the room. They kind of just linger. The other thing is we suddenly love everybody. It's like being <coughs> drunk. It really is. We love everybody. Our perspective changes. And thinking of Nepal, um, when I had the privilege of going there and ministering with Ben, we, we ministered um, in a meeting where they had all the leaders of the local villages and tribes together in this room. Um, and it was great for me because I was leading worship and preaching, but of course I didn't speak the language, so I had no idea what was going on. God came amongst us, Several people fell to the ground. There was crying. There were tears. And out from different sides of the room we were in, I guess there must have been about 60, 70 people in the room, out came two elderly men, and they knelt at the front, and they bawled their eyes out. And then they stood up, and they embraced each other, and then they went back to the congregation and everybody was going wild and I had not a clue what had just happened. Ben told me afterwards there had been two rival churches in the town who had been at each other and against each other um, for years. And as God came amongst us and these men hit the deck, these were the lead elders from the two churches who reconciled there and then and put things right between themselves. All because God came. Sometimes we can get, we can get mixed up, can't we? And we think it's stuff that we have to do. No. No, it's him. I shall never forget it. Powerful. So, so powerful. Years ago, when I was doing crusade work with, um, with an organization, the joy of seeing hardened people coming to the front, receiving Christ, and their face changing before your very eyes. The bitterness, the hardness, the <laughs> just gone. seem to 
notice it so much with young ladies who would suddenly light up in front of your very eyes, touched by the kindness and love of a loving Father from heaven. Let's go quickly into the New Testament. How about this for a verse? Jesus, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I will come to you. And the next verse. No longer do I call you servants. For the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. He calls us friends. So as we go away on Letton Hall, I want to invite you in these next couple of weeks to pray. I want to invite you to pray that a hunger for him would be stirred in the depths of your soul in a new way. A hunger for the reality of his presence. An insatiable hunger. I've got five sessions with you. <laughs> so <laughs> the first one on Friday night, I'm going to expand a little bit more on this whole thing of friendship with God. He wants to be found by us. This is the amazing thing. Yeah? His promise to us is you will be I will be found by you when you seek me with all of your heart. He wants to be found by us. He wants to be known by us. He's the God of encounter. And then as we go into Saturday, God's presence is tangible. And worship is our response to his presence. God's presence is fatherly. God is looking for sons. God's presence is powerful. Who can stand in his presence? He is a life-changing, life-transforming God. And finally, God is with us. He is Emmanuel as we go into Sunday. He inhabits his people. I want to come back on that final session to that last thought. What else will distinguish us from all of the other peoples of the earth but that his presence goes with us? I'm really looking forward to being with you again and all that God will do. Father, as I close now, I want to pray that you would stir us. In these coming days, would you meet with us in our bedrooms? Would you ambush us? Would you sidle up alongside us and speak to us? Prepare us. Put things in our path that we didn't expect. And God, for every young man that's sitting under the sound of my voice now, I pray that you would come and touch. I pray they would know what it is for God to come alongside them eyeball to eyeball. And I say to them as young men, it is time to meet with God man to man for God is growing you up God has things to say to you God has a destiny to impart to you God has things to put in your life things for good that will change the course of your life God means to meet with you powerfully let him come. Seek him out. 
hear his voice. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.